This is Optimal Health Daily, episode 644, an excerpt from the book, The Morning Mind, by Dr. Rob and Dr. Kirti Carter, and I'm your host, Dr. Neil Malik. Happy Thursday. Welcome back to another edition of Optimal Health Daily. If you're new here, this is the podcast where I read to you from some of the best health and fitness blogs out there, and sometimes from books too, like today. Now, Dr. Rob and Dr. Kirti are husband and wife doctors who have teamed up to help slow risers master their mornings. They're both fellow MPHs like me and wanted to provide an easy guide that anyone could use to optimize their mornings. You can find more about them and the book at morningmindbook.com. And I thank them for granting me permission to read this excerpt. And with that, let's jump right to it and start optimizing your life. An excerpt from the book, The Morning Mind by Dr. Rob and Dr. Kirti Carter. Chapter one, the best time to sleep, to eat, or for physical activity. The demands of our daily lifestyles often conflict with the rhythms with which our body works best. Fortunately, understanding these natural cycles gives us valuable information about how we can structure the most fundamental elements of the day, eating, sleeping, and physical activity. If you can successfully build your schedule around circadian rhythms, you will reap some impressive health benefits and at the same time, maximize your productivity. The best time to rise in the morning is different from person to person, yet there are some recommended guidelines based on age. Our circadian rhythms adjust as we mature and accumulate more birthdays, and the optimum time to rise gets earlier. Oxford University researcher Dr. Paul Kelly has studied the sleep cycles of people of different ages, and he came to conclusions about the best time for each age group to wake up. For example, with teens, the optimum waking time is 10 a.m. and sleeping time is midnight. For those in their 30s, that changes to 8 a.m. and 11.40 p.m. And for those in their 60s, it's earlier, 6.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. His findings are quite astonishing considering the predominant nine to five workday patterns of our modern world. Dr. Kelly commented on this predicament, quote, we've got a sleep-deprived society. It is hugely damaging on the body's systems because you are affecting physical, emotional, and performance systems in the body. We cannot change our 24-hour rhythms, end quote. When we are teenagers and our bodies are still growing, our circadian rhythms are biologically hardwired to go to sleep late, about midnight, and to wake up late, about 10 a.m. This would be the ideal time for us to operate. When we are sleep-deprived, we have elevated levels of cortisol, the stress hormone, and reduced levels of neurotransmitters, which leads to a decrease in concentration and increase in moodiness, typically found in this age group. Our circadian rhythms conflict with the schedules of most academic institutions, which start much earlier. However, the brain of teenagers and young children are just not prepared to assimilate information appropriately at that time. Dr. Kelly was a head teacher at a school in the United Kingdom, and he found that changing the start time of the school to 10 a.m. produced a 19% rise in the grades of his students. Imagine the implications for personal performance in all areas of your life. You can excel by merely working in harmony with your body's natural rhythms. As we get older, in particular beyond our 30s, we need less sleep. Thankfully, our body clock adjusts so that we profit from our natural rhythms if we go to bed earlier. Optimum eating times. These times give our body the chance it needs to properly digest food before bed. For breakfast, The time of rising plays a big part in choosing when to eat. If you stay up late at night and wake up late in the day, like a teenager, for example, then it can be more beneficial for you to have a light breakfast and focus on lunch and dinner to gather your recommended daily calorie allowance. Conversely, if you wake up early and go to bed earlier as someone in their 50s or 60s, then a substantial breakfast to fuel you for the day and a more modest meal for dinner will be more suitable for your body to handle. For example, With those in their 20s, the optimum eating time for an evening meal might be 9.30 p.m., whereas someone in their 50s might find an optimal eating time at 7 p.m. Optimum times for physical activity. Some of you may be thinking that there is no such thing as an optimum time to engage in physical activity. You might prefer to avoid it altogether or somehow outsource it to your marathon training neighbor. However, the optimum time for you to engage in physical activity is in the afternoon to evening when several beneficial elements of the circadian rhythms may make this undesirable activity slightly more palatable. At this time, 
body temperature is at its highest, so the muscles are warmed up and ready to perform. Additionally, testosterone production is at its peak, while cortisol production is at its lowest, thus increasing your performance potential. If you are the connoisseur of overexhausting yourself, then later in the day is the best time to capitalize on this hormonal dynamic, known as the testosterone-cortisol ratio, or TC ratio. This ratio is commonly used to describe efficiency, and a high TC ratio has been shown to correlate to the time your body is most prepared to train and recover from physical activity. Please note that these guides are by no means definite, and some people will undoubtedly find that they do not fit into this schedule as their unique circadian rhythms march to the beat of a different drum, at least they think so. From studies, the optimum physical activity time for teens was shown to be 6.30 p.m., and it gets earlier with age. For example, it was shown to be 4 p.m. for those in their 30s and 40s, and 2.30 p.m. for those in their 60s. Dodge bad timing. Understanding the best time for various activities throughout the day also sheds light on when certain activities are best not attempted. There are some behaviors we exhibit, ingrained in our social norms, which simply do not serve our best interests from the perspective of our biology. The major external influence on our circadian rhythms is light, and how carefully we align our behavior with the rise and fall of the sun affects how well we function. A significant problem humankind is experiencing involves artificial light from screens and other technological devices because it confuses our body clock into thinking we should stay awake. That's because light inhibits the release of melatonin, the hormone that governs sleep. To make matters worse, this artificial light stimulation usually happens right at the day's end, precisely the time we should be winding down. A common byproduct of staying up late is the consumption of caffeine in the morning. In a study published in the journal Science Translational Medicine, researchers found that consuming caffeine can also delay the release of the nightly dose of melatonin, creating a vicious cycle of staying up late, being more tired in the morning, and thus increasing the craving for coffee. Between 7 and 9 a.m., when cortisol levels are at their peak, also happens to be the time of day some people choose to consume caffeine. Cortisol is the body's natural way of becoming alert, so to experience this double dose of stimulating chemicals can increase tolerance and reduce the potency of both. Consequently, if you must have coffee or some other caffeinated beverage, The best time would be when cortisol levels have decreased, after 9.30 until around 11 a.m. Cortisol plays an important role when you wake up via the cortisol awakening response, or CAR. The hippocampus is known to regulate the cortisol increase that occurs during the morning, although exactly how this works is still a mystery. Researchers at Dresden University of Technology's Department of Psychology have hypothesized that the mechanism behind CAR is related to the hippocampal ability to communicate information about the external environment to the central nervous system as environmental awareness and directions for how to navigate in the physical world. It is possible that the hippocampus's situational awareness and anticipation of the day's activities play prominent roles in the cortisol awakening response. This indicates a sophisticated and intelligent relationship between the brain and the circadian rhythms that influence our morning activities. Summary we always have a choice about how we live our lives. Fully comprehending how you can function optimally in accordance with your circadian rhythms means you can create a schedule that opens up space for better performance and more efficient use of energy. If you can eat when your body really wants food, then you will require less effort for digestion and have more energy for life. You just listened to an excerpt from the book titled The Morning Mind by Dr. Rob and Dr. Kirthi Carter. Again, you can find more about them and their book at morningmindbook.com. So before the new year, I was talking about light and how it influences sleep. And then earlier this week, we were talking about how important sleep is for overall health and willpower and wellness. Do you need any more evidence to put that cell phone away before you go to bed or put that tablet away before you go to bed? Clearly, the evidence is mounting. Now, of course, we're not saying you need to completely stay off of your phones all the time, but maybe an hour or even 30 minutes before you decide to shut your eyes for that long winter's nap, think about putting your phone away, turning off the light, and just focusing on your body. Or at least put the phone away and try reading a book. Do something different than staring at a screen. Oh, and if you choose to read a book, you probably don't want to pick one that's thrilling 
or science mystery, kind of find one that's more relaxing, that doesn't get you thinking too much. Now, speaking of books, before I go, if you want to be entered to win books from us, come by oldpodcast.com and join the newsletter. It's totally free. You'll hear from us once a week with some life tips, quotes, and updates, so we won't bother you too much. And it's a great way to show that you like what you hear. I thank you in advance for doing that. That'll do it for Thursday's episode. Thank you so much for listening and all the way to the end. I'll be back here tomorrow for a usual Friday Q&A and where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this show and Optimal Living Daily, the brother podcast of this one. Literally, I'm Dr. Neil's brother. If you like the format of this show, you'll love Optimal Living Daily too, where I also read to you from blogs, but cover other topics like personal development, finance, and minimalism from bloggers like Derek Sivers, The Minimalists, Zen Habits, and many more. So for more amazing content read to you for free, come subscribe to Optimal Living Daily too, and together we'll optimize your life. You've been listening to Optimal Health Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us and remember, your optimal life awaits.